Okay, so I'm going to present work on uh, stereotyping of immigrants, uh, both from different outgroups, but also across different countries, uh, which makes that actually one of the first studies that is able to look at, you know, the standing of immigrant groups comparatively, both within uh, and across countries. Um, I'm going to be light on the theory and focus more on the results, because I think that'll be uh, the more interesting part for today. Um, we asked ourselves a couple of questions. Uh, so one of them is, you know, there is obviously widespread resistance against immigration that is very well documented both in the United States, um, but also for, in Europe, for example. But one of the questions that interested us is, is there actually a difference in the standing of different immigrant groups within the same country, right? Do, do people discriminate with regards to where immigrants come from in their sentiment uh, against these immigrants? Um, and also, how do these perceptions then differ across countries? Is there uh, is immigrant sentiment or immigrant outgroup sentiment uh, different in the U.S. than it is uh, from different countries? Um, one, and one of the, the last questions we're interested in is, uh, is there sort of a group cue effect, right? So you have in, in the social welfare literature, you have this finding um, that racial resentment drives a lot of the uh, perceptions and a lot of the standings on, on social welfare. Do we see a similar effect in immigration? So does you know, sentiment against the um, less liked outgroup actually drive some of the policy opposition to immigration? And maybe more specifically, um, we are also interested in how Middle Easterners are perceived, especially post 9-11. I think there is now a couple of studies that investigate that question as well, but it is a relatively new uh, question. So as I say, light on the theory, in the literature there is usually two sort of dimensions or a set of attributes that are related to stereotyping of immigrants. Uh, one of them refers to economic threats, and that is sort of the perception that if we allow, to, um, if we allow more immigrants into the country, the welfare rolls will swell, um, it might create some competition in the low-wage market, which is particularly, I think, driving immigrant sentiment or immigrant, anti-immigrant sentiment in the European Union right now. Um, and that translates into concerns about self-sufficiency um, and economic skills of immigrants. And the other sort of major uh, group of traits is cultural stereotyping, sort of uh, perceptions of immigrants not being able to fit in, not willing to fit in, um, but also insisting on special privileges uh, to maintain cultural and linguistic uh, distinctiveness. Um, and we can maybe add a, a third cluster of, uh, um, of uh, traits to that, related to crime. Um, so how do we go about this? We have data from the Comparative Immigration Attitude Survey, which is representative. It's fielded by YouGov um, to national samples between January and July 2010. We have three Anglo-Saxon democracies, as I say, US, UK, and Canada. And we have a battery of questions, uh, both uh, with regard to policy opposition to immigration, but more importantly, with regards to uh, traits of these immigrants and how these immigrant groups are seen uh, and we rely both on the modal outgroup which in the US is obviously Hispanics, uh, it's South Asians in the UK uh, and Canada and Middle Easterners. We, you know, we can say Middle Easterners slash Muslims, obviously there is some overlap there between Middle Easterners and South Asians uh, in the UK and Canada when it comes to religious affiliation, um, uh, but those are the two immigrant groups we rely on. Um, we have a bunch of uh, closed-ended trade ratings uh, relating to the sort of uh, groups of trades that I've outlined, uh, one of them relating to economic self-sufficiency, uh, specifically uh, percep percep perceptions of laziness, um, ability to help the host nation make technological and scientific advances. Uh, then we have a different set uh, of trades uh, relating to cultural assimilation, uh, mainly willingness to learn English, now, eagerness to assimilate and insistence on special privileges, as well as uh, perceptions of religious fanaticism. And then, as I say, we also have an item uh, capturing attitudes on crime or lawfulness. And then we have dichotomous positive negative trait ratings, uh, which allow us very nicely um, to use uh, an IRT model. And this goes back to sort of the idea that we can capture or avoid some of the measurement errors uh, if we rely on a scale of items that tap into the same underlying construct. But obviously here what we need is we need a measurement model that allows for different items to contribute differently to the underlying latent traits, right? So we, we uh, rely on the two-dimensional IRT model that uh, I'm not going to go into in detail. Uh, what's important though is that we need to place appropriate constraints on the discrimination parameters, right? So what we essentially want is we want a set of parameters uh, that is sort of specific to each outgroup. 
uh, to make comparisons between the different outgroups within countries. And we can do that by constraining the discrimination parameters beta 1 and beta 2 to be zero for, say, uh, Hispanic items or items describing Hispanic, the Hispanic outgroup in the US for one dimension, and then to be zero for items describing sentiments against the Middle Eastern outgroup for another dimension. Which sounds a little bit technical, but in result what we'll have is we'll have a set of discrimination parameters or model parameters that describe sentiment against one outgroup and a different set of parameters that's, that describe sentiment uh, against the other outgroup. Um, and then we do some uh, model checks and uh, validation tests. So our model fits the data better than, for example, a parsimonious one-dimensional IRT model. It also actually fits the data better um, than a model that assumes uh, two dimensions that are not outgroup specific, but specific to economic and cultural threats, which is uh, for us um, very validating because it confirms the idea that uh, people discriminate according to outgroups, potentially even more so than, uh, than discriminating according to you know, the, the set of different traits. Um, and uh, we, we have some validation checks that uh, make us feel confident about the nature of our resulting latent traits. Um, so we can test two things with this model. One of them is centrality, you know, which, uh, which trait, which particular trait drives uh, outgroup sentiment the most. Um, but we can also talk about valence. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the technicality here of how we can assess valence because it's a little bit complicated. I want to show you these graphs instead and uh, do it with these graphs. Um, so if we run our model, uh, the unconstrained version where we get you know, discrimination parameters or model parameters for each outgroup separately in each of the countries, you know, we get something like this, and this is from the item on religious fanaticism in the US, um, where you can already see because of the steeper curve, uh, sorry, the steeper slope, and then on the y-axis you have the probability of a stereotyped answer, um, but because of the steeper slope, we can say that uh, the item uh, contributes more to Middle Eastern stereotyping in the US than to Hispanic stereotyping, which is certainly a sensible conclusion, especially post 9-11. But as you see here, there is some overlap here, so it's really hard to assess sort of the main difference in valence or evaluative direction uh, of these items. So what we can do, we can again put further constraints on the discrimination parameters, uh, put them equal, constrain them to be equal to each other, so that we have this difference here as our main effect uh, in, in valence. Uh, and this is what we end up doing. Um, but first, let's talk about the centrality. Uh, and I want to bring to your attention that this is now not about the evaluative direction of traits, but just about the question, which traits do, uh, drive outgroup sentiment most in our three countries? OK, so on the left-hand side, we have stereotyping against the modal outgroup. Again, that's Hispanics in the US and South Asians in the UK um, and Canada. And we can see that in the US especially, concerns about the ability to speak English drive outgroup sentiment the most, right? And we can also see religious fanaticism in the US and Canada drive very little um, in terms of uh, outgroup sentiment. And what do I mean when I say drive? Well, technically, uh, I mean that our latent trait does not explain a lot of variation in these, uh, um, in these particular traits. Right? Um, but uh, for a more substantive interpretation, I think we can say, uh, we can talk about centrality or importance. Um, and then if we look at a Middle Eastern stereotyping, we certainly see a difference when it comes to religious fanaticism. Right? So religious fanaticism uh, drives outgroup sentiment against Middle Easterners much more in, uh, in the US and Canada than it is in, uh, the case for the modal outgroup, which again is a sensible finding um, after 9-11. Um, and we have also some other differences. So, for example, in Canada, eagerness to assimilate, concerns about eagerness to assimilate drive uh, stereotyping of both outgroups to a higher extent than in the two other countries. Um, so, we can see some variation already there. Um, but more interestingly, let's talk about valence. Uh, or, you know, what outgroup is seen more negatively on what particular trait taking into account for our measurement model. So, on the y axis, we have the probability of a stereotype answer. Uh, and now this is within countries where we can make comparisons for a particular trait across outgroups. Uh, so for example, on, uh, on the left we have uh, the US comparison of Hispanics and Middle Easterners. Uh, Middle Easterners are usually seen much more negative, right? The higher the value here on the y-axis, the more negative the outgroup in question is seen. So for example, when it comes uh, to ability or perceptions of the ability to speak English, Hispanics are much more penalized than Middle Easterners. 
And that holds generally true for most items, with the exception of, of course, religious fanaticism. Again, no surprise there. Uh, and we can look at the UK where the pattern is reversed, right? Um, so Middle Easterners are penalized much more than South Asians. And that generally holds, actually in the UK, that holds for all traits. Um, and that relationship generally holds in Canada as well, where Middle Easterners are penalized more than South Asians, right? And if we look at sort of the overall valence, we can see that in the US, you know, due to the positive value there on the y-axis, Hispanics are worse off than Middle Easterners, which is quite an interesting finding, we believe. Um, but in the, on the other hand, uh, the other two countries, Middle Easterners, are penalized more than South Asians. Two minutes, wow. Um, we can also do uh, the same um, uh, within outgroup across countries, uh, and there we sort of see that Hispanics in the US are off the charts. They're more penalized than any of the other modal outgroups in the two other countries. Uh, so Hispanics are probably the outgroup in the three countries that is the worst off. Um, and we can do the same for Middle Easterners. And we see already that Middle Easterners in the US are not much more penalized than in the three other countries, uh, two other countries. Except it turns out that Middle Easterners in the UK are seen more negatively than Middle Easterners in the US, which is also quite an astonishing finding. Okay, so in the second step, we go and try to predict outgroup sentiment. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about it. Interestingly, in the US, um, the racial resentment item, which we rely on the sort of the classical items uh, to construct our racial resentment scale, wipes out the effect of identifying with the conservative party. Um, then you have some of the main effects that make sense. The older you get, the more stereotyped you are. Uh, the more education you have, the less, the, uh, the less stereotype or stereotyped answers you give. So the less, you know, you discriminate against uh, immigrant outgroups. Um, uh, being black is in the US at least associated with being more uh, stereotypical of immigrant groups. Um, and being a member of the model outgroup, obviously there is sort of a cohort effect. You don't want to discriminate against your own outgroup. Uh, interestingly, maybe we are able to explain a lot of variation of our measure in the US. That is certainly not true for the UK and Canada, which is also interesting in itself, I believe. Um, and then lastly, we predict policy opposition to immigration. And remember, we have this hypothesis that the sentiment against the less liked outgroup should drive on an individual level um, uh, uh, policy opposition to immigration more than sentiment against the more liked outgroup, if that makes sense. Uh, and one of the beauties of our sort of empirical approach is because the regression sta uh, coefficients are standardized by design, our latent trade scores are constrained to lie on you know, the unit variance scale and uh, mean zero. Um, we can directly compare the coefficients in question. And we already see in the US, remember the modal outgroup was seen more negatively. Indeed, sentiment against the modal outgroup drives more with regard to um, policy opposition than sentiment against Middle Easterners. Yeah? And in the UK and Canada, where the relationship was reversed, Middle Easterners were more penalized, we have the opposite relationship. So that certainly is quite an interesting finding. And I've put a factor on this too. So in the US, uh, sentiment against the less liked outgroup is 1.4 times more important um, than sentiment against the more liked outgroup uh, in predicting pol policy opposition to immigration. And that factor is almost two for the UK and over four for Canada. So an interesting finding. And lastly, uh, we also uh, find that uh, cultural stereotyping or cultural concerns are more important for our underlying stereotype measures than economic threats. So we can simply take the mean of the discrimination parameters in question, and we find that across all models and outgroups, the discrimination parameters associated with the cultural dimension are more important than the discrimination parameters um, that describe the economic dimension. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.